Hey, we weren't being recorded then, were we? Were we being recorded? No, no, cool, cool. cool. Okay. Shh, 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 shh. So, uh, someone did ask me about the MiGs. The MiGs did a related attack. There's a famous attack called the man in the middle attack. The man in the middle attack is what you have to be worried about when you're doing your SSH initialization. So someone was quite rightly worried. Well, not, it's probably fine about that on the weekend. Man in the middle can happen like this. I think I'm communicating with, is, is it Sando? Omar, sorry, Omar, I always say that, don't I? With Sando I was just talking to you before, where are you? Yeah, yeah, okay. So I want to communicate with Omar. So I say, I, I'm going to now negotiate a protocol and we're going to set up some sort of link. But evil man in the middle, who's Brad, has snipped our phone, Brett, has snipped our phone wire. And the phone wire now goes from me to Brett, and then Brett can do whatever, Brett's computer, and then Brett has it for you. So I'm negotiating, I think I'm negotiating a connection with you, but really I'm negotiating with Brett. And simultaneously, Brett is negotiating the connection with you. Does that make sense? Now, it's very hard to detect this, because I could say something to detect it's not Brett. I could say something like, uh, maybe you and I agreed in advance the secret color was puce. Okay? So I could say, just to check, I really made the connection with Omar. Hey, Omar, what's the secret color? Brett thinks, I don't know what the secret color is. So what does he do? He echoes it back to Omar. Hey, Omar, what's the secret color? Omar says, puce, Brett, puce. As long as he keeps echoing everything backwards and forwards, we, it's very hard for us to tell he's there. Does that make sense? That's called the man in the middle attack. And the famous example of that's called the MIG in the middle attack. Um, uh, how did it work? Uh, I'll, I'll probably get the USS and, um, and USSR mixed up here. USA and USSR mixed up. I can't remember which side was which. But essentially, you know, radar sends a pulse out to detect something and it bounces off the thing and goes back. So I could just go bing and it hits you and bounces back. And I get boom coming back. And by timing how long it takes, does that make sense? But someone worked out, well, that's a lot of, I'm spending a lot of power to broadcast that high frequency radar pulse. I think it's very high frequency, is that right? Or is it very low frequency? Low fre lower than light, is it? Okay, I'm using a lot of power to broadcast that low frequency radar pulse. Why don't I encode some information into it? Because it's just a radio, it's like radio, it's just different frequency. So instead of going bing, I say something like, what's your password? And when he gets a pulse from me, instead of just echoing back, boom, which will happen automatically off his radar, he also broadcasts back, my password is Simon or something like that. Does that make sense? So you can actually use, uh, like, my radar detector can detect who he is as well as a Pong. So then on my screen, as well as seeing little blitz coming towards me, I'm also seeing names under them, like Simon and bad guy and things like that. <laughs> if, if, if he replies, I'm a bad guy. <laughs> Does that make sense? So, you, so in the early days, they set it up so that the, guy, the systems that detected planes could also request authentication from the planes. And in the response, they would broadcast back some authentication. And that way, you'd be absolutely safe because uh, you'd only fire down and kill the bad guys and you wouldn't fire at your own. Does it all make sense? And to stop uh, a replay attack, which is someone just tape recording, bing, what's your name? Bong, Simon. And just replaying back, bong, Simon, when everyone says, bing, what's your name? Like, we have a challenge response system. So I say, what's, um, apply the special function to 52, and you'll go, bong, the answer is 19. And I'll never ask for 52 again. Next time I'll say, apply the special function to 76, and you go, bong, the answer is 112. And as long as I ask different questions every time, you can't replay a tape of that because your response has to relate to my specific question. Does that all make sense? OK, all right, that's just a basic thing. So anyway, how the funny thing worked was, and I can't remember which side worked it out, but if, if there were Russian, let's suppose the uh, US worked it out. Now, let's suppose the Russians worked it out. <laughs> it's more exciting that way. So here's the US battleship, and here's a Russian MiG zooming in. And the US battleship, and they're not fighting, they're just, this is a cold war, everyone's just annoying each other. <laughs> okay. and, and the US battleship sends a message out saying, and he's, he's, a, good, he's a good guy, he's Mike, uh, who is the good guy? I uh, uh, can't remember the name of the guy. Tom Cruise. He's Tom Cruise, up here. <laughs> with their triumphant music. Da, 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 da. And then, here comes a Russian, yeah, he's coming in. And the ship goes, bing, what's the magic number for 42? And the Russian, what does he do? He goes, sends up to here a pulse to Tom Cruise, bing, 
what's the message for 42? And Tom Cruise says, bong, it's 17. And he goes, bong, it's 17. And the sheep goes, it's Tom Cruise. <laughs> so as long as you were flying, this is very clever. You see, it's called the MIG in the middle, like the man in the middle. So it's very clever. And the, yeah, anyway, it's very clever. OK. It probably was the other way around. I probably flipped the nationalities. Uh, that was a complete distraction. Now, what were we talking about? OK, so the big question, the big question we left with was this. Shh, 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 shh. The big question we left with was, how can we achieve our dream state? And our dream state is a way of defining types so they've got functions on them that can change. The implementation of the functions can change. Yeah, the, the behavior of the function stays the same, but the implementation can change. Well, we have that already by breaking it into two different files. But also so the type can change. Again, the functions still work, but the underlying type is different. Like, I've taken up my engine, I've replaced it with pygmies. Yeah, but as long as the steering wheel and blinkers and pedals and all the interface things still work, it shouldn't matter whether there's an engine in there or a pygmy. Does that make sense? And everything should still work correctly. And then you put in the most appropriate thing, whichever makes the car go best in the particular circumstance you've got. Okay, so how can we achieve this? And were we to be able to achieve this, we're going to call the type we create an abstract type. Well, in, in some languages it's easy. In some languages, you just create the type and say, this type is abstract. And once you've said that in the language, it means no one's allowed to use the type. They can only use the interface functions. So if anyone tried to use properties of the type, the system would crash. If they tried to initialize it using an array initializer, the system wouldn't even check to see if it was allowed or not. They'd go, Bzzz, you can't access this type. If they tried to pass it one way rather than another way, the system would go, Bzzz, you can't even assume that. The system would just catch them. But that's a modern language. C is a very old language. None of this stuff existed. They didn't even have abstract types probably when C was invented. No one even thought of the idea. So C just lets you do anything you want. So we can't rely on C to stop us doing it. In some modern languages, like object-oriented languages, you get this behavior for free. And that's fantastic. Anyone that's programmed in an object-oriented language is just, you, you're normally so happy and overjoyed because you're dealing with abstraction all the time and it just works. And you can't break it no matter how hard you try. That's a really lovely thing. But C, unfortunately, lets us break it. And the danger of breaking it, let me just repeat why it's so bad to break it, is if it's possible for this guy or this guy to rely on this being an array, if it's possible for them to do that, then one day we're going to change this and they're going to break. And we never want that to happen. In the old days of the Intel chips, when they were released, they had all the interface functions but they also had some undocumented functions. They were functions you could call on the chip that did special things, but they weren't guaranteed in the interface. Like, for example, if anyone's been using Tim's 48917 emulator, you'll have found there are some, un you might have found, there are some undocumented opcodes that do really funny things. There's one that if you call one function and pass in the right number, it starts a little movie showing Tim dancing around after he's finished running the program. There's all these undocumented features you can call and use in there. But because we haven't told you them in the interface, we're free to get rid of them at any time. You see that? Because no one can rely on them. But what happened with the Intel chips? Does anyone know? There were these undocumented features, and undocumented features in, in the BIOS, and there were undocumented features in the Lola. There were all these undocumented features everywhere. Yeah? Didn't they kind of go to Microsoft and say, OK, here's our special undocumented features now. Build into your operating system things which depend on these. Uh, no, but it was almost as bad. What happened was, if you wanted to do graphics, the features the operating system gave you to do graphics were too crap, and your graphic was just big blobs of stuff moving around really slowly. But if you look closely into how the whole graphics system worked and the graphics chip and the memory mapping, you could work out clever, undocumented ways of making graphics super cool and super fast. So all the game programs started using all these undocumented features of the chip. Does that make sense? And undocumented features of the BIOS. I can't remember which I said it was using, but some undocumented features. And the games ran like anything. And then when the new chip came out, or the new BIOS came out, maybe these undocumented features didn't work anymore, because they weren't guaranteed. So suddenly a whole lot of games just stopped working. Now, how did that make people feel? Angry. <laughs> it made them feel happy with Microsoft. <laughs> and there was such a backlash against it, what, did, what, what actually eventually had to happen? Those undocumented functions were then documented and retro built into it. Because no one wanted to annoy hundreds of people who bought PCs to play games, 
or thousands or whatever. So they became official features. Now this is a danger we face. Anything we have in the interface here, like, oh, I'm using an array, even if it's not, we're not regarding it as important, and we're not regarding it as a key feature, and we're not regarding it as part of the interface specification, if it's in there and people can make use of it, they will. And once they've made use of it, we're stuck with it forever. So we've made our interface too big. We've put in stuff we didn't need to put in, and now we damn well have to support that forever. And it's a real pain because it means forever now we're stuck with arrays, and there's so many better ways of doing it. So the danger is if people are, if programmers can even get a sniff at what the type is, they'll rely on it. And once they've relied on it, we're screwed, and we can never change it. So we want to prevent the programmers from ever using it. Now I reckon we have two approaches. Oh, catch your question in a sec. No, no, it was an approach. Yes. Oh, yes. Okay, good, all right. Let me get to that in a second. That is a very good solution. But it's not going to work. But it's, it's a step in the right direction. So it's very clever. I like it. Essentially, I reckon our possible solutions to this problem fall into two categories. Category one is trust people to do the right thing. <laughs> in that one here, we say up here it's an array. But then we put in a comment saying, but although it's an array now, this could change in the future. So please, don't rely on it being an array. Now, what do you think of the trust people to do the right thing approach? I like it. <laughs> I can't even put a Mars bar in the fridge and trust myself not to eat it. Okay. <laughs> Trusting people. I, I like the way you like it. I mean, it would be good if the world was like that, if we could trust people. Look, A, people, I love people. But speaking as a people, we're stupid. So we'll, we'll use it without even reading the comment or we'll misunderstand it or we'll use it by mistake. So we're stupid. And two, we're lazy. So we'll think, oh, I'll use it now and I'll fix it later. And we never will. And three, we're just, you know, annoying. So we'll think, he said I can't use it. Oh, <laughs> damn, I'm using it everywhere now. So we just cannot rely on people. So what we need is some way of enforcing it. So not that we hope the programmers won't do it, but so that they just can't do it. Now, you had a good idea, which was, well, maybe instead of putting the type in this dot h, we put the type in another dot h. And this dot h includes that dot h. Two things to say. One, as a general principle, we don't like dot h's including other dot h's because it, it, it can cause problems. So we try and avoid that. But two, if this dot h can include this dot h, then this must be visible and readable. So the programmer can find this dot h. And so it's really like that dot h was really inside there. Remember hash include means it just write it in. So he'll find this and use it and rely on it. The trick is if the programmer can know it's an array, they can assume it's an array and everything will work. So we don't want them to even be able to find out that it's an array. So here's how we do it in C. It's slightly convoluted. We do the following diabolical thing. We are going to have to put some type in here because Sudoku grid is used here, and the type Sudoku grid is used here, and these programs are going to chuck a wobbly if they don't see a definition of Sudoku grid when we try and use it. So there's going to have to be a definition of Sudoku grid up here. But we're going to do what you think. The definition of Sudoku grid up here is going to be a lame definition that doesn't tell the full story. And the full story will be told over here in a way that they can never see. Here's how we do it. At the top of Sudoku grid.h, let me write Sudoku grid.h. Or let's say, oh, I'll talk about the project in a sec. I was going to do it in the project, but let's do it in Sudoku grid first. In the top of Sudoku grid.h, we say type def struct Sudoku grid. Uh, oh, no, I'm putting a silly thing in. Oh, oh. S A. Oh. Oh. Okay. Sausage P. We say type def, struct, sausage P. Then we're going to put, uh, 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 and then all we're going to say is. So you know what I've done so far. What have I done so far? I've said, I'm about to define a type def, and the word's going to be Sudoku grid. 
So whenever you see the word Sudoku grid, it means this. So I'm defining Sudoku grid to be a struct. Okay? So it's going to be something that holds multiple pieces of data. But here's the diabolical thing I'm going to do. Sudoku grid is a pointer to a struct. Now that tells C's a lot of information. That tells C that Sudoku grid is a pointer, which means how's it passed? By it's passed by reference. So we know we're always passing by reference, so we know that now. We're not relying on anything weird. It tells us how much memory to set aside for a Sudoku grid. How much memory does a Sudoku grid need? Four bytes as much for a pointer. So now whenever it sees a definition of a Sudoku grid, it can set aside memory for a pointer. So main is going to be completely happy. But it's a pointer to what? Well, it's a pointer to a struct called sausage p. And what does a sausage p struct look like? That's the right answer. Can we just have that? So the question is, the question that every programmer wants to know is, OK, it's a pointer to a struct. And what is that struct? And the answer is, eh. <laughs> eh. <laughs> eh. I'm not telling you. <laughs> I don't know. Who cares? So we don't tell the programmer. The programmer sits there and worries, and they dream about it. They think, maybe it's a struct that looks like this. Or maybe it's a struct that looks like this. Or maybe they don't know. They'll never know. They can't access it. They can't use it. It's just a pointer to a struct. Does that make sense? Now, what do we have to put in Sudoku grid.c? We'd better define it, yeah. In Sudoku grid.c, we say struct sausage p curly brace is, and whatever we said it was before, it contents with your values, and it's an int that's a counter of some sort, whatever. Does that make sense? So now, lo and behold, we have a type that we've created that's defined in here, and the definition belongs to here. And we can change that definition as much as we want, because only the functions in here can access that struct. No one over here can access the struct, because they're not allowed to know what the struct looks like. Does that make sense? We're all cool? The people over here don't know the names of the variables in the struct. So if the people over here, suppose I'm main. If I wanted to set cell 7 to 5, and I've got a grid, how can I set cell 7 to 5? I have to use set cell, which is an interface function. I cannot say cell.contents dot five because I don't know about contents. It belongs over here. I haven't imported Sudoku grid dot C. I don't know about contents. Does that make sense? So this guy is forced to only use the interface functions. Yes? Uh, does that mean in the unit test that you can't just say... Thank you. What's your name? Rob. Rob has hit the million dollar question. The unit test was the key to the whole thing. Why did I write a get cell when we didn't need one? Dane. You don't know how they're going to be storing the values in their array? Because this lets us access a cell without being able to access the array. So in other words, we can access a cell without knowing what the type is. So we can unit test, because we couldn't unit test without a get cell if this was going to be abstract. So I can say set cell 7 to 5. And then how am I going to test it? I can't look at the array to see that cell 7 is 5, because I'm not allowed to know it's an array. What do I have to do? Get cell and see if it's 5. They don't have to be correct. They just have to match each other. Whether they're correct or not, that's an intentional thing. That's what um, Turing would say. How do you know if it's really self-aware? You don't. You never do. You never can. It doesn't matter. It's just if it appears to be correct, it is correct. So if set cell and get cell work perfectly, then who cares if they store the array this way, or they store the array that way, or they store it in a spiral, or, or they don't store it as an array. It doesn't matter. Does that make sense? So is full and get free sort of work together? Clear cell and um, is full sort of work together. They, these guys all sort of work together. So you would test these functions using each other to test them because you're never allowed to access the type. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes? Yes. 
All right. Well, we have 20 minutes left. In these remaining 20 minutes, I'm going to show you one piece of syntax you need, and then I'm going to talk about the project and how all this applies to the project. The one piece of syntax you need is this. Let's look at the problems we had over in Maine. Remember I said there were three problems that related to the type, three ways Maine assumed the type was a particular type. One of them was it could just peep into the arrays directly, so that's it's not allowed to do. One is the way it passes it assumes pass by reference, which was assuming it's an array. Well now, can we assume our abstract types are passed by reference? Yep. Yes, they all are because they're all pointers now. So the pointer is copied. Yeah, 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 but we're sharing a pointer to the same underlying object. So everything's sort of passed by reference now. And the third way is how we set it up to start with. Uh, like, for example, in unit test, you remember we set it up with an array initializer. You can't create a new guy unless you know what the guy is like. I can't say, make me a new Sudoku grid. You would quite rightly say, but what's a Sudoku grid? If I told you it's an array of 81 ints, you'd go, OK, here's a new one. If I told you it was a structure that contained an array of 81 ints and a counter, you'd go, oh, here's one. If I told you it was three arrays all linked together with cross pointers and two structs and nine booleans all linked together with a char, you'd go, oh, here's a big one, here. <laughs> but unless I tell you, unless you know what type it is, you can't make one of them. So that tells us who has the job of making an abstract type. Once you've got an abstract type, who gets to make those guys? Yes. This side. They've got to be made over here. The users cannot make them because they don't know enough about them to make them. So and there has to be an interface function here that lets you make them. And I didn't give you one for the first assignment. I didn't give you any way of making one of these guys. We made it in main and we made it in unit test. I gave you a way of filling it with values using retail, but I didn't give you a way of making one to start with. So we need to be able to make them. Why didn't I give you a way of making them? Because it would have made the assignment much closer to this next assignment. I was thinking, oh, I really want to give them a function to make it. There has to be an interface function to make one of these guys, because all abstract types need a function to make them. So I need to give you a function to make a Sudoku grid. Why didn't I give you a function to make a Sudoku grid? It would become a lot more complex and you would become a lot more errors? Yes. And why in particular would that be the case? I mean, that is the reason. Yes. Carl. Because we didn't have a way of defining a variable in such a way that it would have swoop in the function ends. Yes. Thank you very much. If, now let's go back to our code here, Sudoku grid.c. Sudoku grid.c, suppose it had an interface function called make grid. Here's how make grid works. Does a lot of stuff, and what does it return at the end? Returns a grid that we've just made somehow. Now, how did it make the grid? Well, it must have made the grid by putting it on the stack. So make grid would put a grid on the stack. And then at the end, it would return that grid. And the outside world would have a grid. But what's the problem? Yeah, the grid's an array. So the array is set up on the stack here. As soon as this function term, and we return a pointer into the array, that's what an array is. As soon as the function terminates, what happens to that array? It's gone forever. The problem with most of our variables is when we create them, they disappear forever when the function stops. The only things that doesn't happen for are the concrete types, like ints and chars. They get copied out, and the copy's perfect. But if a, if a pointer gets copied out, if an array gets copied out, I mean, if an array gets passed out, it's just a pointer into the array. And if the array is defined on the stack, when the stack finishes, the array's gone. You need a way of creating a variable that's not on the stack. So that's spot on, Carl. Well done. So you need a play, a way of creating, putting aside an area of memory which won't get destroyed when the function terminates. And there's a way of doing that in C, and it's called malloc. Malloc is, um, I guess, memory allocation. Or perhaps it's, no. <laughs> perhaps it's a really lame joke that's not even funny enough for me to say. 
Okay, oh, you can guess. Fill in your own joke. It will be funnier than that joke. <laughs> and tell me later on and I will claim credit for the best of them all. Yes, that's what it was. It was that one. Yes, Theo, well done. Okay, what was it? No, I can't tell you now. It's abstract. I can't tell you. No, no, no. I can't tell you. I, it's an abstract joke. I can't tell you what the joke is, but you can query the joke. You can say, was it funny? Oh, it was very funny. <laughs> say the joke twice. Ha, ha, ha. Ha, ha, ha. Made me laugh twice, but you can't actually ever find out what the joke is because it's completely abstract. We hide it away. Um, okay, so there's a, there's a C command called malloc, and what malloc does is if I draw a picture of memory, let's draw a whole computer's memory in, our, in the way we've always been drawing it, with big addresses down the bottom, little addresses at the top. Remember our code lives up here somewhere? And down the bottom, what lives down here? The stack. We don't want to store it down here, remember, because that gets zap, zap when the function finishes. And the code lives up here in something called the code segment. It's a whole area of memory. And we know exactly how big that is before the program starts because we've pre-compiled the program. So we know where that finishes. And underneath that, we have an area of memory called the heap. Has anyone heard of the heap before? The heap's an area of memory just for... People don't want to use memory. It's stack is really organized. The heap's like, if you've got a heap of clothes, what does it look like? It's a big mess. It's a big ugly mess. You just chuck it in, you pull things out, you do whatever you want. It's a big mess. It's up to you to look after the heap of clothes. So the memory heap is just a whole heap of random memory and anyone who wants can use it and it's up to you to look after it. Whereas on the stack, it gets looked after for you, doesn't it? When your function terminates, the memory gets reused automatically. The biggest danger with using memory on the heap is I say, oh heap, give me a couple of bytes. And the heap goes, okay Richard, you can have these bytes. And how does it tell me where those bytes are? It gives me a pointer, yeah. So it hands me a pointer to a couple of bytes. Maybe I ask for 20 bytes. So it says, okay, Richard, here's a pointer to those 20 bytes. They belong to you now. And I say, oh, thanks. And I put a whole lot of crap in there. That's like my bedroom. And I fill it up with rubbish. And then I've finished. Now, what do I do? If I'm good, I tidy it all up. And I say, oh, by the way, I don't need that memory anymore. Thank you very much. And it says, ah, oh, cool. Thanks for telling me. I'll hand it to the next person that needs it. But probably what do I do? I'm like, ah, I finished with that. Now I'm going to go and do something more interesting. And the, and the operating system doesn't know, and that bit of memory is set aside forever for me, even though I'm never going to use it again. And suppose I ask for this 20 bytes inside a function, and that function gets called a thousand times. Every time it gets called, I ask for a new piece of 20 bytes. I've got 20,000 bytes of memory that I've used up on the heap that I'm never going to restore. That's really bad. That's called a memory leak. And if your program has a memory leak, the longer it runs, the more memory it sets aside and forgets to restore at the end. Uh, eventually your computer runs really slowly. Um, I don't know if any of you run an operating system that has this property, that after you've been running it for a while it starts to seem to be more slow. Yeah. Uh, so, so a good, nice, tidy boy scout or girl guide programmer will always request memory with malloc and then when they're finished they'll always free the memory. Now, the command to, to get memory, if I wanted, um, uh, if I wanted to get enough memory, uh, so what have I got? I've defined, let's have a look here, Sudoku grid, oh no, what have I done wrong here? Hey, is everyone happy with that now? This is from the previous lecture. Sudoku grid is a pointer to a struct, and the struct looks like that. So if I wanted to set aside enough memory, I would go, um, Sudoku grid game. Now enough memory is set aside for game. How much memory does game need? Four bytes, because what's game? It's a pointer to a thing. Okay, so four bytes get set up here now, that's cool. And they're set up on the stack, okay, because it's just a normal variable. And then I'd go, um, uh, What am I going to call it? Yeah, that's a problem, isn't it? <laughs> All right, let's not worry about what I'm going to call it. To get a pointer to it, I'm going to say malloc game. Have I done that right? What have I done? Do I need to do size of game? This is something I should have thought about a little bit before the lecture. <laughs> and I will think about it immediately after the lecture. 
You call the malloc and you say how many bytes you want. I don't think you give it an exemplar. I think you say the number of bytes. Is that correct? So I would have to say something like uh, malloc size of, hmm, let me write this bigger somewhere. Let's move that up there so we can see that. Let's write it in here. I would have to say, uh, now I'm going to create it. So where am I at the moment? Where's this code residing? Am I talking about code that lives in Sudoku grid.c or code that lives in main? Here. Because only this guy can make it, okay? Only this guy knows what it looks like. This guy doesn't know what it looks like. This guy does know what it looks like. So this guy's going to have to say something like, uh, oh, uh, I think I need another type def, don't I? Am I going to go struct? I don't want to write struct sausage pea. Yeah, oh, I certainly have to say, set me enough memory aside. Size of? I need, yeah, so I need a name for struct sausage pea. Yeah, I need a name for that. No, I don't want to say struct sausage pea. I think I need another type there. I think. Uh, yeah, I have a better idea. You say, you make a function in your interface that says, how about you, you allocate enough memory for however much. Uh, no, hang on. I, I think I can do it with another type def in, in a neat. I mean, I just got to remember the neat way of doing it. We have a neat convention we follow. But is it right that I can just do. Oh, man, I think I need another type def for what a Sudoku grid points to. Oh, I can say struct, but we had this rule that we weren't going to say structs anywhere except in the def. All right, well, we say it any. All right, I'll have to modify the style guide. We can say struct here. All right. Uh, struct sausage p x. Oh yeah, I don't, I need a pointer to it, I don't need the whole thing, thank you very much. So I need size of struct sausage p. And what I've been agonizing about as I've been going to and fro is thinking, I didn't really want to write this here. I want to, no I don't have to. What I want to do, but I can't do at the moment, is I want to have type def this to be something. Yes, I know, I know. Okay. But let's for the moment say we're doing this. Now let's just decode what we've done here in steps. Shh. Sausage P is the underlying hidden type, okay? Struct sausage P. That's the struct that we're about to create that these guys know about and these guys don't know about. Size of tells me how many bytes that takes. Malloc, that many bytes, is asking the operating system to give me that many bytes. Now let's think about what it'll probably be. If I'm storing 81 chars, that's going to probably take 81 bytes. And I'm also storing an int and that takes 4 bytes. So that's, eight, what's 81 plus 4 is 85, and it probably rounds it to the nearest, it probably uh, starts them on boundaries, so it probably pads it out a little bit. It might need 88 bytes to store that, say. So it's probably going to say this struct is 88 bytes big, because it won't actually put the ints immediately next to the array, probably, depending on the way I put them around, probably. Anyway, so it'll ask for some number of memory around about 88 or 85 bytes, or however much it needs. And this will allocate it. Then that will be a pointer that, to that will be returned. So this, what is going to get returned is a pointer to one of these structs. Now what did we call a pointer to a struct, one of these structs? We called it a Sudoku grid. So what we'll get is Sudoku grid grid equals malloc size of blah, blah, blah. Uh, Now someone tell me, do I need to typecast or is it just going to typecast automatically? And see, it's going to type custom form. Cool. All right. I think it warns you you don't type In some versions of C. Certainly. Shh, shh, shh. <laughs> to be absolutely perfect, the question I've just asked these guys is shh, shh, shh. I tried it before I came here and I didn't need to do it. But I was surprised. What's happened is this is returning a pointer to one of those structs. 
C might not know what it's a pointer to, so I might have to tell it it's a pointer to one of these fancy things. So that would be a type diff. Uh, I mean a typecast that I put in here. But I think I can leave that out. So let's leave it like this. And if, if, you have to, if we have to fix it up, we'll do it in the tutes. But I'm pretty sure this will work. So this now, this line of code is better than this line of code, even though it does the same thing. This line of code created an area of memory called a grid and gave us a pointer to it. This line of code sets aside an area of memory called a grid and gives us a pointer to it. But this one set the memory aside on the stack, which is tidied up at the end. And this one set the me me memory up on the heap. So our function can return it. And when the function terminates, it still lives there. So we've created a new thing. If we've created a new thing, we've got to be able to destroy it at some stage later on if we're going to be a good housekeeper. So there should also be an interface function called dispose of grid. And dispose of grid has to do something like the, the, mem the operation we need is called free. So you go free grid. Does that make sense? And that will destroy, that will free up that piece of memory. Now there's a lot of danger with freeing up memory. What could happen? What's that? Yeah, yeah, no, it doesn't delete it. It just like says, oh, that's available for other people to reuse. But yeah, you could pass in a pointer to something you're still using. You could get it mixed up a bit and say, delete that. And the operating system will go, okay, huh, it's gone. The contents are still there, but it's available for reuse now. And if it was something that you were using, and I accidentally deleted your thing. Yeah, yeah, you're a function over there. You're happily using some piece of memory. And I said, delete his piece of memory. <laughs> then your piece of memory, as far as you can tell, still looks all right. And you save stuff to it, and it's still there. It's still memory. It still exists. And uh, your values haven't been deleted. They're still there. So you keep using the memory. But unfortunately, the operating system, Philip, now thinks that's a free piece of memory. And if someone else says, hey, I'd like a megabyte of memory, please, Philip will go, sure. And you can have this piece too. <laughs> he was holding out to sell out. He was holding out the whole block. But now we sold this last lot on the block. We've got a whole megabyte free. You can have that megabyte. And you're living in the middle of that megabyte. And you start writing zeros throughout the whole megabyte. You're in the middle of fooling around with your little special bit and suddenly, whoa, it's all full of zeros. How did that happen? So you write your values back and you thought you'd cleared it. Now it's got a little house in the middle again. Does it make sense? So you don't want to free something unless you're absolutely sure that no one's ever going to use it again. So freeing is, uh, is, is fraught with danger. But if you don't free, then everything turns into a mess eventually if you call your function 20,000 times. All right. So I believe that's all the C syntax you now need to know to create an abstract type. And any type you create in this way, we're going to call abstract. And it's going to get the badge of honor. What's the badge of honor for an abstract type? Capital S. So this would be how we define Sudoku grid. Now let me tell you about the project. It's almost exactly the same as this. Your project is in three phases. It's got the same. Bits over here. Got a different name. All right, everything's looking good. Your project is to play the game that you've all been playing, Blackadder and Bulger. Your ultimate objective at the end of phase three is you will have written a diabolical player to play this game. And your player will be cunning and clever and really good at playing the game. Can they, cheat? Uh, they, they cannot cheat. <laughs> <laughs> We've put a comment in somewhere saying, please don't cheat. <laughs> now, here's how we go. Let's look at time, a picture of time. Here's what time looks like, in case you've ever wondered. <laughs> this is phase one, phase two, phase three. Phase one is a whole lot of group work, due really soon. You work on that in your tute. If you've got a Thursday tute, you've got much more time to plan and much less time to code. If you've got a Tuesday tute, you've got no time to plan and heaps of time to code. No one's going to be happy. <laughs> if you're in the middle, you haven't got enough time to plan or code. <laughs> so what you're going to have to do is if you've got a Tuesday tute, you're going to look at the spec, what, Tuesday morning tute, you look at the spec, say, tomorrow morning. <laughs> no, I'm joking. If you're Tuesday tute, you'll leave here now and you'll go and look at the spec. It'll give me an, like half an hour to answer questions and get back to my office and make it all public. And then you're going to look at the spec and you're going to dream about it tonight and think about it tonight. And, da -da 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 -da. and when you turn up to shoot tomorrow, you'll already know what you're going to do and you're going to have the most time to code of anyone. And if you've got a Thursday one, you're going to start thinking straight away and you maybe will even contact other people in your shoot before the shoot 
And maybe your tutor will too, and you'll start bouncing ideas off each other, and you'll have a rough idea of what it looks like. And by the time your tutor comes up, you'll have already worked out probably exactly what you're going to do. Oh, that's so, so good. Gee, both of those sound good. It's just the poor people in the middle I feel sorry for. OK, so here's what we're going to do. You're going to do a whole lot of group work here. Shh, 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 shh. The group work happens in two stages. Stage one is the whole shoot together agrees on an interface, which means in practice you're agreeing on a .h file. The whole shoot agrees on the interface, and everyone's happy. And you've got a half an hour in the shoot time to do it and an hour in the lab time to do it. And someone's going to document it and write it up afterwards, and let's hope they do that. Once the .h file is agreed, in, in the groups you broke into last week, you should all give your team a, your little groups of four or three a name, so we can call all the team's names because your names will be appearing. In your team, suppose you're in team blue. Someone had a team blue. Suppose you're in team blue. Team blue will write some um, code which implements this interface. They will actually implement an ADT. And they will hand that in and get a group mark for that, plus a few other little jobs. They have to write testers for it and a little referee. That's what the groups do. And that's phase one. So at the end of phase one, you know what the interface is. You've got each group has an implementation of the interface. Each group has written one of these. And you're ready to go. Then in, in phase two, individual work now, you write your player. And the player plays the game. And any time the player wants to know something about the state of the game, wants to know how many cards have been played or whose turn it is or if this is a legal move or, any, or how many cards this guy's played already or who passed last or any questions like that, he, the player's not going to work those out. The player's going to ask the ADT. And the ADT is in charge of representing all the state about the game. So the interface functions here that you'll pick in your chute will be a whole lot of useful ones that you really think your player's going to want to have. And your player's not going to have to think about any of those details. Your player's just going to work out how to play the game in a cunning way. And throughout all of phase two, you write a cunning player. Or it could be a really stupid player that just works out a random legal move and makes it. That would also be fine. And then phase three, and you submit that at the end of phase two. Phase three, we start the competition. And every night, we run a competition where all the players play each other. And we come up with a massive ranking of who's the best player and who's the worst player. Does that make sense? Every night we do that. Some of the nights it's for marks and some of the nights it's just to practice. And in phase three, you can resubmit your player as often as you want. So you'll look, oh man, I'm coming number seven. Oh, I'm coming seven. And suddenly super lightning player number three uh, comes along and knocks everyone out and beats everyone. And you look at the logs and you see how they play and you think, oh, I can beat that. Or, or you're just down the bottom. You're always playing number 200. You think, why am I always coming 200? Why am I always Baldrick? I hate it. And then you have this brilliant idea one night. I know, I should play cards when I can. So you change your code. <laughs> and, and you resubmit. Does that make sense? You resubmit and then, OK. So the idea is a big competition that runs every night. So phase one is we write the ADT. Phase two is we use the ADT to write our player. Phase three is we keep working on our player to make it better and better and better and better and better. At the end of phase three, so there are five performance marks handed out over this week. At the end of phase three, we then just run a big competition with no more updates allowed. And there's another five performance marks handed out for how well your final player goes. Does that make sense? Yes, shoot. Uh, is it one player each or one group? One player each. Group work to write the ADT. Shoot wide to write an interface. Individual to write a player. Does that make sense? Marks for all the bits. Uh, now, shh, shh, shh. to get you warmed up, to get you thinking along the right tracks, oh, we've got like only seconds. Here's the question you're going to have to answer in your tutorial. You're going to have to think what function should go in the interface. Well, think about it. What function should go in the interface? You already know two that should be in there, something to make a, something that represents the state of the game and something to delete it. You need a creator and a deleter. But think what other functions you're going to need. Does that make sense? You just think of all the useful things you could want. But here's the, here's the twist. If you put too many functions in the interface, what's the cost? You have to write them all. It's a real pain. 
but you have to write them in your group. So that's not too bad. What happens if you put too few functions in the interface? Your player has to do all the work. So the interface moves work from your player to the group. So make it big enough that your group can do it, but not so big you can't do it. And not so small you have to do all the work yourself. Come and see me. Come, come down to me.